Well, good afternoon, brethren. It's wonderful to be all together here, even if it's by digital uh, technology, together on the Sabbath. I hope everyone's having a wonderful Sabbath day. It is wonderful to, to be able to know about the Sabbath and to enjoy a day of rest every week. I'd like to, as I always do, start out by giving a, a shout out to some special ladies, to Nancy Miller, to Daisy Swint, to Martha Frederick, to Alice Joe Stant, and to Jean Ward. I hope, Jean, you're doing well and you're recovering, and we're all praying for you. And also a shout out to Bruce and Teresa and John in Monterey. I think Bruce is traveling down to Monterey uh, this coming weekend, so... It's a very uh, fraughtful trip. Uh, it's a very dangerous down in Mexico, so please keep Bruce and his family in your prayers. Brethren, as many of you know, I love languages. In pursuing the many languages that I have formally studied in high school and at the university, as well as languages that I've studied on my own, I've always been interested in how language affects culture, how culture affects language, how language affects people, how language affects ideas, and how language affects history. A perfect example of how language affected history was the Tower of Babel. You know, after the flood, all the people spoke one language. And when the people united together to rebel and disobey Yehovah, he confounded their language. They could no longer communicate with one another, so the unified community suddenly broke apart, and they all went their separate ways, and history never was the same. It's interesting how the same word in different languages can have completely different meanings with completely different connotations and completely different reactions. A great example of this word is the word gift, G-I-F-T. To an English speaker, that word has a pleasant connotation. And when the word gift is heard, the hearer usually has a very positive reaction. A gift is something an English speaker would want and would choose and desire. However, the exact opposite is true to a German. To a German speaker, the, the word gift has a completely different connotation and reaction yielding a very negative reaction. The reason is that the word gift in German means poison. In old World War II documentaries, you can see canisters of Giftgas, or poison gas, in Nazi concentration camps. Same word, same spelling, two completely different meanings and reactions based on language. You know, the Bible was written using two main languages, Hebrew and Greek. And whereas the Hebrew language was a language that was constructed and crafted around the worship of Yehovah and has been preserved by the Jews in their worship of Him, the Greek language was a pagan language of a pagan people in a pagan culture worshiping pagan gods. The Hebrew culture and concepts of Yehovah were force-fit into the Greek language. An important fact to understand is that the translation of a document or an idea or a text or a concept or a name is never as good or as accurate as the original source language that it was written in. Expressions in one language do not necessarily and usually do not translate well into another language with the same impact, the full impact of their meaning. Now this is true of the translations of the Greek texts into English, and that leads me to the topic of today's sermon. In my sermon this afternoon, entitled, Who is the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming? And instead of trying to spell it, I'll, I'll show this. It is H-O-E-R-K-H-O-M-E-N-O-S. Ho Erchomenos. And it means the one who is coming. I'd like to explore the subject of 
the occurrences of Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming, and the scriptures of the New Testament, and explore the identities of the beings referred to by that title. To begin with, the Greek word Erchomenos, this is this word right here, Erchomenos, is the present active participle of the Greek verb Erchomai, that's E-R-K-H-O-M-A-I, it's Strong's number 2064, which means to come. It's the verb to come. The present participle in English is widely used in everyday speech. The present participle in English is formed by adding the ing to the main stem of the verb, such as write, writing, drive, driving, talk, talking, watch, watching, work, working, sleep, sleeping. The present participle is used in English most often as a way as the way that English speakers form the present tense. We almost never use the simple present tense in English, which actually infers a repetitive action such as he goes to the store, which infers that he goes repetitively to the store like he goes to the store every day or every week. Instead, in English, we form our present tense by conjugating the, the helping verb to be with the present participle of the action verb that we're using. We do this without thinking, and we do it naturally. We say, he is writing a paper. He is driving home. He is talking on the telephone. He is watching a movie. He is working at the office. We say, he is sleeping. We don't say he sleeps. Greek uses the present participle in many of the same ways that we do in English. In English, we use the present participle also as an adjective describing a noun such as the crying baby or the screaming man or the printing machine in much the same way that the Greeks use it as an adjective in their language. The Greeks have a way of making a present participle into a noun by simply placing the word the in front of it. This is how we arrive at the phrase ho erchomenos. Ho erchomenos. This is the Greek word the, and this is the present participle erchomenos. This is how we arrive at the phrase ho erchomenos, which literally means the coming one, or the one who is coming. In English, we cannot replicate this simple addition of the word the in front of the present participle and create a new noun. We must add a few extra words in the sentence to accomplish the same grammatical construct here in English. So with the words ho erchomenos, we just simply can't say the coming, whereas you can in Greek. Although it makes perfect sense in Greek, it makes no sense in English. We have to add additional words. So, ho erchomenos in English would not be the coming, but rather the one coming or the one who is coming. In this construct, Greek is much more efficient than English. The Greek phrase ho erchomenos appears 23 times in the New Testament, referring to two beings, which leads to the two points of my sermon today. The first point in today's sermon is, point number one, Jesus is the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming. Jesus is the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming. Please turn with me to Matthew 3. John the Baptist was performing his ministry, pro proclaiming the need for repentance and baptizing people. But John the Baptist knew that the one preparing that he was preparing the way for the Messiah, the anointed one. And we read this in Matthew 3 and verse 11. Matthew chapter 3 and we'll begin in verse 11. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes, which is ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, after
after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So he referred to Jesus as the Ho Erchomenos, the one who was coming. Please turn with me to John 3. John the Baptist also knew that his ministry would diminish and that the Messiah's ministry would increase. And we read this in John 3 and verse 30. John chapter 3 and verse 30. In John chapter 3 and verse 30, we read, He must increase. These are the words of John the Baptist. He must increase and I must decrease. He that comes, ho erchomenos, the one who is coming from above is above all. He is of the earth. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He that comes, ho erchomenos, the one who is coming from heaven is above all. Please turn with me to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. When John the Baptist was in prison before he was executed by Herod, he sent two of his disciples to Jesus to confirm that he indeed was the Ho Erchomenos. In Matthew 11, and we read in verse 1, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Jesus was referred to as the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. Please turn with me to Acts 19. Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul referred back to John the Baptist and his disciples that they would believe on Jesus, the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. We read this in Acts 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And he said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Please turn with me to John 6. After Jesus had performed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, many were convinced that Jesus was the promised Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. And we read this in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 13. John chapter 6 and verse 13. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of truth, that prophet, that should come, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain, himself alone. So they knew him as the 
ho erchomenos. Please turn with me to John 11. Lazarus had died days before, and Jesus arrived in Bethany and met with the grieving family. And while there, Jesus conversed with Martha to comfort her. And we read this in John 11, and we'll begin in verse 23. John chapter 11 and verse 23. Jesus said unto her, Your brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, shall, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming into the world. Martha, Martha believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of Jehovah. And she believed that He was the ho erchomenos, the one coming into the world. Please turn with me to Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21, and we'll read a well-known account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem the week before his death. We read this in Matthew 21, beginning in verse 4. Matthew 21, and we'll begin in verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you, the daughter of Zion, behold, your king, king comes unto you, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put, them, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming in the name of the Lord, or Yehovah. Hosanna in the highest. A reading of Matthew 21 and verse 9 in the Greek shows that the Lord is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, K-U-R-I-O-S, without the definite article the. As, we've, as we have explored in previous sermons, the grand majority of the usages of the occurrence of the Lord in the New Testament where the Greek, where the Greek word is kurios without the definite article, the in Greek are references to God the Father. Again, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, and the name of God our Father, Yehovah, was not transliterated into Greek. They instead gave him the title kurios. So Yehovah was given the title Kurios instead of transliterating his name. But they gave him the title without the, 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 the definite article, the. So Yehovah's name was then lost in subsequent translations. It was not transliterated, so it was given a title, and so his name was lost. And his name is still lost today. But references to Yehovah, God our Father, are found throughout the New Testament through the use of kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, without the definite article the in Greek. The account of Matthew 21 and verse 9 also appears in Mark 11 and verse 9. That was Mark 11 and verse 9 and John 12 and verse 12. John 12 and verse 12, using the exact same Greek words. This exclamation is a repetition of the prophecy in Psalm 118 
and verse 26 concerning the coming Messiah. Please turn with me to Psalm 118 and verse 26. The Jews were all expecting a Messiah. This verse was used as one of those prophecies. Psalm 118 and verse 26. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's Yehovah. We have blessed you out of the house of Yehovah. Blessed be he that comes in the name of Yehovah. So Psalm 118 and verse 26 was understood by the Jews concerning the Messiah coming in the name of Yehovah, coming in the name of God our Father. Jesus the Messiah, the Anointed One, was the ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming in the name of Yehovah. The Messiah was not coming in His own name. Jesus was not coming in His own name. The Messiah was not Yehovah. Jesus was the ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming in the name of Yehovah, His Father. Please turn with me to Matthew 23 and verse 37. Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jesus was saddened at the future destruction of Jerusalem because of continual disobedience to Yehovah, his father. And that complete and total destruction of the city came within four decades of his life on earth. In Matthew 23, beginning in verse 37, Jesus again repeats this prophecy, but with a twist. Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes, the whole Erchomenos, in the name of Yehovah. Again, this is a repetition of Psalm 118 and verse 26, with the same words in Greek as in Matthew 21, verse 9. But this time, the reference is not to the prophecy of Jesus coming as the Messiah at that time, but Jesus' reference here in Matthew 23 is the future coming yet to be fulfilled. Yet in His future return and coming back to the earth, Jesus Christ is not described as the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming. And the grand majority of the occurrences of His coming in the future, a different Greek word is used. That Greek word is parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, parousia. It's Strong's number 3952. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A. Strong's number 30, 3952, which means an arrival, an advent, a presence, a coming. Some very well-known verses contain this Greek noun parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. -A. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. In the famous resurrection chapter, Paul wrote about Jesus and His arrival. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22. We read this set of scriptures every year. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll start in verse 22. Paul wrote, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. That's parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. It means arrival. 
afterwards they that are Christ at his arrival. Please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. This word parousia is used so much in the New Testament, in Paul's writings. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not, ye, are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? at His parousia, at His arrival. Please turn with me to 1 John 2 and verse 28. 1 John 2 and verse 28. In 1 John 2 and verse 28, John writes, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his parousia, arrival. Please turn with me to Matthew 24. All of the prophecies concerning Christ's return use the Greek word parousia. In Matthew 24, in verse 3, all very well-known verses that we've read for decades. Matthew 24 and verse 3. In Matthew 24 and verse 3 we read, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your parousia, your coming, your arrival, and the end of the world. Matthew 24 and verse 27. A little later in the chapter, Matthew 24 and verse 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall the, the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man be. In Matthew 24 and verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming, the parousia, the arrival of the Son of Man be. And so Jesus' arrival in the future is described in Greek with a different noun and in a different way in Greek than His first coming. This just does not show up this way in English. The, in English, the same word coming is used everywhere. So the expression ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, was used to refer to Jesus' first coming as the Messiah, the anointed one of his Father. It is not used in an expression as for his future arrival. This is important because his initial arrival to earth, to the earth in the future, is not with his Father to do battle against the evil forces on earth. Rather, his initial arrival to the earth is to collect his saints in the first resurrection and to take them back to heaven to present them to his heavenly Father and to our heavenly Father as, he has, as has been discussed in previous sermons. So Jesus Christ is the ho erchomenos, as the Messiah who came to the earth. Brethren, there is another being mentioned in the Bible who is the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, which leads to the second point. The second point in today's sermon is point number two, God our Father is the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming. God our Father is the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming. A few concepts to review as we get started in this section of the sermon. You know, as discussed and explored in previous sermons, the identity of God the Father, our Heavenly Father, is hidden in plain sight in the pages of the Bible. Instances of the Lord, or Yehovah, all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps, or Yehovah in the Old Testament, are English equivalences to the name of God our Father. 
or Yehovah. Instances of Hotheos, H-O-T-H-E-O-S, Hotheos, the God, in the New Testament are references to God our Father. And as we have discussed earlier in the sermon, the grand majority of the usages of the and the occurrences of Lord in the New Testament, where the Greek word is kurios without the, the definite article the, are references to Yehovah or to God our Father. In fact, when you add up all the instances of the God, Hotheos, instances of kurios without the the, Instances of my father, instances of our father, instances of the Almighty, instances of the living God, and instances of God Most High. The New Testament discusses our, our Heavenly Father, God our Father, as much, if not more, than Jesus Christ, His Son. God our Father is everywhere in the pages of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's incredible and actually disheartening that the majority of mankind, even a majority of the, of the members in the churches of God, do not realize and understand this important truth. Please turn with me to Exodus 3. Exodus 3, and we'll read a well-known section of Scripture where Moses meets Yehovah for the first time at the burning bush. In Exodus 3, in verse 4, Exodus chapter 3, and verse 4, another very well-known set of scriptures. Exodus 3, and verse 4, And when the Lord, that's Yehovah, when Yehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and Moses, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off your shoes off your feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. That is, Ha Elohim. The Ha is the word the. It was the God. He was afraid to look upon the God, the mighty one, Yehovah. So now we are witnessing a conversation between Yehovah and Moses. And Yehovah introduces himself to Moses in verse 5, as the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In Exodus 3 and verse 13, a little later in the chapter, Exodus 3 and verse 13, we read, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, You shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. And God said moreover unto Moses, You shall say unto the children of Israel, Yehovah, the Lord, Yehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations." Now please turn with me to Acts 3 and we'll read an important explanatory verse. In Acts 3 and verse 13, we read these same words. And it shows who this being is. Acts 3 and verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His Son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied Him in the presence of Pilate, when He was determined to let Him go. So this verse shows that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, was God our Father, because He glorified His Son Jesus. Please turn with me to Acts 5 and verse 30. 
Acts 5 and verse 30. Just a couple of pages over. Acts 5 and verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you slew and hanged on a tree. So this verse also shows that God of our fathers, the God whom the Israelites worshipped, was God our Father because He was the one who raised up Jesus. So Yehovah in these verses is God our Father. In verse 15, Yehovah tells Moses that His name is Yehovah. And in that verse 14, and in verse 14, Yehovah tells Moses that He is the I Am that I Am. Now, in verse 14, the words, I am that I am, are the Hebrew words, Aye, Asher, Aye, Aye, Asher, Aye. The, the Hebrew word, Aye, is the first person singular form of the verb to be in the imperfective aspect. Again, as we have explored in previous sermons, Verbs in the imperfect, imperfective aspect can denote future actions, past actions, or present actions which are repeated on a continual basis, or past or present actions which move forward in time in a progressive manner without completion. The fact is imperfective verbs are not completed. The action has not yet been completed. Most translators in English and other languages have chosen the simple present tense in the wording of the phrase, I am that I am. However, the, the simple present tense in English does not adequate, adequately convey the progressive and imperfective nature of the verb. Aye denotes more than a simple state of being. It conveys a dynamic state of being that transcends the past, the present, and the future. An option for translating A.A. Asher A.A. that conveys this dynamic state across time in English would, would be, I have been who I will be, which would convey a past continual state of being in the past up to the present, as well as a, as a future continuing from the present, both states of being, past and future, without a completion. The Septuagint translates A.A. Asher A.A. as Ego Ami Ho'on. This is Ego Ami Ho'on. Now, it means I am the one existing or I am the one who is being. The word own, this word here, we'll, we'll see this a little later in the sermon. This word ho-own is the Greek present participle of the verb to be. It's being. Just like erchomenos is the present participle of the, the Greek verb erchomai, to come. In the, in the second part of verse 14, I am has sent you is translated in the Septuagint simply as Ho on has sent you, or the one who is being has sent you. It was not translated as ego I me or ego Amy, I am. The Jewish scholars knew that meaning of Aye would not be properly conveyed by simply using ego Amy or I am. Yet, here we have it in English as both as being I am that I am. Please turn with me to Revelation 1 and we'll read a title given to God our Father through the words given by God our Father to Jesus Christ who then gave them to the Apostle John who then wrote them to the seven churches in Asia. This title in Greek denotes the same dynamic state of being that transcends the past, the present, and the future as the Hebrew title A.A. Asher A.A. did in Exodus 3 in Hebrew. Verse 1 shows that the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to him by God, by the God, God our Father. 
Now, in Revelation 1 and verse 4, Revelation 1 and verse 4, we read, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loves, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So, brethren, we can gather that the being who is and who was and who is to come is God our Father because that being in verse 4 with that title is differentiated from Jesus Christ in verse 5. So the title, the one which is and which was and which is to come, which is this, in the Greek is hoon kai o hoein kai o herhomenos. Hoon kai o hein hoein kai ho erhomenos. There it is in the English transliteration, and it means the one who is and who was and the one who is to come. That's the translation in the King James Version. Now, the words ho-on are the Greek noun form of the present participle of the verb to be. This part here is exactly what was in Exodus 3 and verse 14 and 15. Greek is a very progressive language, and the present participle usually denotes a continuing action presently and into the future. The word ho-ain, the second, the second part of the name, ho-ain, that is the past imperfect form of the verb to be, which denotes a continuing, uncompleted action in the past. So the Greek title ho-ain, ho this first part, the first line, denotes the same dynamic past, present, and future existence as does the Hebrew title Eye Asher Eye in Exodus 3. But here in Revelation 1, God our Father is given another title in addition to Ho'ain, Ho'on Kai Ho'ain. That additional title is Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. Please turn me to Revelation 4, where we will read another occurrence of this full title. Revelation 4 and verse 1. Revel Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, and said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now who has his throne in heaven? It's God our Father. And in verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was what and is and is to come. Hoain kai o ho on kai ho erchomenos. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lived forever and ever, 
The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. For your pleasure they are and were created. Now, in verse 8, Lord God Almighty in Greek is kurios, meaning Yehovah, hotheos, the God, meaning Yehovah, ho pantokrator, which is the, the Greek word for the Almighty. They're just Greek equivalents to Yehovah ha Elohim el Shaddai, words that we all know. Except these are all references to Yehovah, to God our Father, the God, the Almighty, and Kurios being Yehovah. Please turn with me to Revelation 11. And we will read another account of this title given to God our Father. Revelation 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. So the, our Lord and Christ are two different beings. The kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God, Ho Theos, the God, God our Father, on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, Ho Theos, the God, God our Father saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and were and are to come. That's, again, ho on kai ho ein kai ho erkomenos. Because you have taken to you great your great power and have reigned. The title given to God our Father these four times in Revelation shows that the being who was the Aye Asher Aye of Exodus 3, the being who is Yehovah, God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the being who is the El Shaddai, the being who is God Most High, is indeed coming. Please turn with me to Hebrews 10, and we'll read another section of Scripture showing that God our Father is coming to the earth. Hebrews Chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 30. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 30, we read, For we now know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord, kurios, without the V, that's Yehovah, God our Father, shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, a ho theos, the God, God our Father, that after you have done the will of God our Father, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, will come and will not tarry. Now hold your place here in Hebrews and turn with me back to Matthew 16. We'll come right back to Hebrews in just a minute. In Matthew 16, 
We'll read one verse. Jesus was asking his disciples who they thought that Jesus was. And Peter answered him in Matthew 16, in verse 16. In Matthew 16, in verse 16, we read, And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Anointed One, the Son of the living God. So Jesus is the Son of the living God. So the living God is God our Father. Please turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. Still holding your place in Hebrews. During his trial before the high priest and the Jewish leaders, the high priest demanded an answer of Jesus. And in doing so, he referred to Yehovah in his demand. Matthew 26 and verse 63. Matthew 26 and verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you be the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, Hotheos, the Son of the God, Yehovah, God our Father. Again, we glean from these verses that God our Father is the living God. Now let's turn back to Hebrews 10. In verses 30 through 36, of Hebrews 10, all the references found in these verses, including Lord, all caps, that's Yehovah, the living God, that's God our Father, and the God pertain all to God our Father. It's all the subject here in Hebrews 10 is all referring to God our Father. And then we arrive at verse 37. The subject has not changed. The being referred to here has not changed. The author of Hebrews is still referring to the same being, God our Father, in verse 37, as he had in previous verses when he wrote, For yet a little while he that shall come, the ho erchomenos, the one who is coming, will come and will not tarry. So Hebrews 10, along with Revelation 1, Revelation 4, Revelation 11, all show that God our Father is coming. God our Father is coming continually now to His saints through His Holy Spirit that He's given to us, that He gives us so freely. But this title of Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming, denotes that God our Father is also coming in a physical sense. The prophecies of Zechariah and of Jude and of Revelation, among others, show that God our Father, along with Jesus Christ and the whole host of heaven, are coming back to this earth to battle the evil forces of Satan and of man at the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Please turn with me to Revelation 16. And we will read a prophecy of that end time battle of all battles. In Revelation 16, and we'll start in verse 14. Revelation 16, we're talking about the end of the age here. Revelation 16 and verse 14, where God our Father and Jesus and the angels finally come and intervene in the affairs of man. Revelation 16 and verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Well, brethren, what is the great day of God Almighty? We know and have explored previously that God Almighty, El El Shaddai, and in Greek is ho pantokrator, is God our Father, and that God our Father is Yehovah. So that great day of God Almighty is the day of Yehovah, or the day of the Lord, or the day of God our Father. Please turn with me to Zechariah 14, and we will read some very well-known and well-read verses. 
But the being referenced in these scriptures has been very misunderstood and misidentified through the years. The being in these scriptures is God our Father, not Jesus Christ. In Zechariah 14 and verse 1, Zechariah 14 and verse 1. Behold, the day of Jehovah comes, and your spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then shall Jehovah Go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in the day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives, which shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And we usually stop reading here, but there's a big kernel of truth in verse 5. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azal. Yea, you shall flee like you have fled from him from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And here it is. And Jehovah my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. In many places, it's with Him. So, Jehovah, God our Father, is coming to the earth to do battle against the armies of evil on the day of Jehovah. And He is coming with His saints. Please turn me back to the book of Jude, and we will read another well-known verse where the being in the verse has been historically misunderstood. In Jude... Verse 14, Jude, verse 14, we read, And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord, there's no the in Greek here, is kurios without the definite article the, it's Yehovah, it's God our Father, Behold, God our Father comes with ten thousands of His saints. Brethren, the verb to come in the Greek is the same verb, erchomai, to come, which, from which we obtain the present participle, ho erchomenos. Also in verse 14, the verb to come is in the aorist, or simple past tense. So the verse would be, better translated as God our Father has come with ten thousands of His saints. Brethren, we are coming with God our Father, with Jesus Christ, and with all of the angelic hosts to assist in creating a new governmental system here on the earth, a new moral code, a new way of life, a new culture, and a new worship of the greatest being in the universe and of all time, Yehovah, God our Father. What a wonderful future that mankind has in store for it. What a wonderful future we have as part of our Father's kingdom and as part of Christ's rulership here on the earth. Brethren, we have explored this afternoon the concept of the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming through two points. Point number one, Jesus was the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. Jesus was referred to repetitively as the one who was coming, as the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one of Yehovah, the one who was coming in the name of his Father, Yehovah. And point number two, God our Father is the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming. God our Father is given the title of the Ho Erchomenos, the one who is coming in Revelation as a marker and revealer that He indeed is coming in power and in glory with Jesus Christ, with His saints, 
and with his angelic armies to battle the satanic forces of evil at the end of this age. Brethren, it is so exciting that our Heavenly Father has opened our eyes and is continuing to open our eyes more and more to the truth about Him. Again, God our Father is hidden in plain sight, hidden in plain sight in the pages of the Bible. It is truly an honor and a great privilege to understand more and more of the deep things of our Heavenly Father to know more and more about him and his identity in the pages of the Bible, and to grow closer and closer and closer to him, and developing a deeper and deeper relationship with him. What an awesome opportunity. What a high honor and privilege it is. So brethren, let's be busy studying his word, speaking his word, living his word, and obeying his word so that we so that our Heavenly Father will use us mightily in His kingdom to help all of mankind.